Oh, welcome back to Terry Talks Movies. This time I've got some alien invasion movies. One from 1957, one from 1960, both by the same studio. And one of them stars one of the stars of one of the greatest movies in history. They're Japanese, they're tokusatsu movies. They are, for their time, state-of-the-art science fiction adventure films. Now, I probably should explain tokusatsu a little bit. I've used the term a few times on the channel, but it bears clarification. Tokusatsu is a Japanese word which means basically physical special effects, and it's used to describe movies that have a lot of physical special effects in them. Things like Gojira and Mothra uh, tokusatsu, things like Matango and Ultraman. Tokusatsu covers television and movies, so it's a very broad term. It actually started as a concept in pre-movie days, when people were doing kabuki theatre and had physical special effects in that. And also Bonraku, the uh, puppet theatre that Japan was known for before films were around. But it was a well-respected part of Japanese culture even before cinema began. And so after World War II, during the latter half of the Showa era between 1945 and 1989. Tokusatsu movies were incredibly popular in Japan and respect was given to physical special effects. The, culturally, Japan had a long tradition of that. So let's look at The Mysterious from 1957. Now, both of these movies, I've looked at the Japanese version with English subtitles. I haven't looked at the English language version because I think they're shorter and they have bits of culturally specific stuff cut out of them. And I want to get the full original gangster version of these kinds of movies in order to see how they were originally sent out rather than how they were cut together by American distribution companies. Strangely enough, I hadn't seen these movies before, so I came at them clean. In fact, I've had a copy of the second one of these movies, Battle in Outer Space, for a while in a really good DVD collection called Icons of Sci-Fi Toho Collection, which has the H-Man battle in outer space and mothra i've got the deluxe edition of mothra on the shelves but because this is a triple set i'm keeping both of them and this is a pretty good version of that movie but i'll talk about that second up the hysterians i like because it starts out at a japanese bon festival it's basically a cultural festival where the, the villagers gather around and they build um towers they've got taiko drums everybody's wearing either kitsune masks or tengu masks a cultural festival in a village in Japan on a lake near Mount Fuji. Now, it's kind of groovy. You get to see what a festival in Japan was like in the 1950s, which is kind of cool, even though, it, of course, it is staged for a movie. The feel of what those festivals were like. Now, while the festival was going on, a group of people, including an astrophysicist called Shirashi, see something unusual on the other side of the lake. It's a, it's a forest fire. And some of the villagers go to investigate the forest fire and find out that strangely, the trees in the forest are not burning from the top down, they're burning from the roots up, whether it's a volcanic hotspot or there's something weird going on. Some of the people who go to investigate die, but Shireshi is actually kidnapped by aliens who have caused this particular phenomenon. And there are a whole bunch of strange goings on that happen after this while people are investigating what the hell happened to this village, which is soon after destroyed by a landslide which has an odd kind of radioactivity the soil is radioactive one day and has no radiation the next when the teams come to investigate they find hot spots on the land as well and ultimately there's another landslide and a giant monster robot called Mogera, which is the japanese word and i'll butcher that probably for mole comes out it looks like a giant robot mole m-o-l-e not a woman of ill repute and starts attacking things it destroys a freeway it destroys a bridge and the evacuation of the nearby people has to take place while the authorities fight off and ultimately kill this giant robot but that's only phase one of this weird alien invasion because the aliens have also set up an underground base which pops up out of the ground in the dome and shoots death rays at anything that gets too close including aeroplanes and the base starts getting attacked by planes and one of the planes kamikazes into the dome to absolutely no effect. The only start communicating with human beings and you know the technology gets advanced because they actually send a message 
on television screens that are black and white in color. So the technology is so advanced they can turn a black and white TV into a color TV. And these aliens who have colonized Mars from a destroyed fifth planet between Mars and Jupiter 100,000 years ago have decided that they want to come to Earth. They had an atomic war which destroyed their own planet and because of the strontium-90 in their bodies, they're sort of infertile. So the aliens make some demands. They want a, a two-mile radius chunk of land in Japan and they want a bunch of women because why wouldn't you? The authorities don't agree to this but the aliens kidnap the women anyway which is not really nice and then of course they escalate their demands they want a 75 mile radius area of eastern Japan which includes all of Tokyo and so there's a race to find a weapon which will destroy the aliens and stop them coming to Earth from their base on the moon, which is a staging area from Mars. One of the main scientists in this movie is played by an actor who's got an incredible pedigree in Japanese cinema, a guy called Takashi Shimura, who, apart from being one of the Seven Samurai, was also the old public servant in a classic Japanese film, which is one of the best films of all time, Ikuru, which was recently re remade as a movie with Bill Nye. But he was the dying public servant who finds a way to leave a lasting legacy, even though he's been a pencil pusher for his entire life. Fantastic film. And he's in there as just one of the scientists in this tokusatsu movie, which is kind of unusual, but that's the kind of careers that most Japanese actors had at the time. Character actors would go from doing serious films like Ikuro for Akira Kurosawa to Ashura Honda's The Mysterious, where he's trying to find a way to stop an alien race from taking over all the land and marrying all of the women. Interesting that character directors had that kind of career in Japan at the time. And even Honda himself, the director, Ishiro Honda, who had directed Gojira and who directed any number of kaiju and tokusatsu movies over the next 20 or 30 years, chopped and changed from making different kinds of films. The movies he made immediately before The Mysterians were romantic women's films. So it's kind of like, if you want to use an American equivalent, it's as if Douglas Sugg went from doing All That Heaven Allows and Imitation of Life, and then did a Ray Harryhausen um, movie about a giant monster. The, the careers of people in Japanese film at the time were really diverse and interesting. And looking at Honda's backstory, somebody should make a biopic about the life of Ishiro Honda, who had an incredible and incredibly interesting and at times very dark history particularly during world war ii and before i kind of went down that rabbit hole a little bit and it made me appreciate this movie more because it's got that beautiful toho miniature work and special effects work and also optical processing for laser beams and you got some great scenes where the death ray attacks tanks and the barrels of the tank guns melt in real time and all that's done as a practical special effect using the models and I kind of like it. It doesn't in any way look real particularly. But I admire the way they did it and the way they got the story across by having these miniatures and basically destroying them in innovative and interesting ways. Of course, the good guys prevail and we get to see some really groovy sets inside the alien base. And also the rocket battleships that the United Nations create to fight with electron beams of their own. All of that stuff looks really fantastic and Toho was great at doing those kind of set designs and giving us realistic sets where you can go yep i can believe that as an alien base yep i can believe that as a futuristic weapon that the united nations has created to fight the aliens this movie also had a bit of a political edge to it as well japan had just joined the united nations in the post-war period after america made it kind of a protectorate of, of america and by 1957 they just joined the united nations and Toho Studios wanted to kind of underline that by showing an alien invasion movie where the whole world gets together and fights a common menace. Particularly during the Cold War, they were acutely aware of the tensions between Russia and China and America. And Honda, who, after his wartime experiences, really wanted the world to bond together and not to be antagonistic to one another. He had lived the consequences of imperialism he had lived the consequences of warfare on a global scale and he occasionally slipped in these little bits of internationality into his films 
which give them that little bit of extra depth. Oh, that's not a lot. I like the, the fact that the battles are done interestingly. The weapons the humans create to fight these strange alien weapons and this strange alien base. And the groovy alien space station which orbits the Earth and launches little flying saucers to attack things. Beautiful production design. Very space age production design as well. It really is cutting edge. It's almost like Googie architecture in a way. But the mysterious works for me. I mean, it, you don't expect it to have really deep characters or a lot of nuance to it. But it does exactly what it sets out to do, and it does it very, very well. And at the time, Honda wanted to make a science fiction movie that didn't rely on Godzilla or Rodan or anything like that, even though they did slip in Mogera as a kaiju monster. It's a very small part of the narrative, a very small part of the action in this particular movie. So the mysterious work for me. Then we move on to 1960 with Battle in Outer Space which reuses the same alien orbiting space station, which is actually repurposed as an Earth space station in the future year of 1965, where the space station is attacked by a bunch of alien flying saucers, which are really groovily designed. They've got little groovy lights inside them, and also the way they're filmed, the camera and the spaceships themselves were mounted on a platform with the little spaceships hanging off wires, and both the camera and the platform moved against a background rather than moving the background and the ships. The camera and the ships moved against a static background. And it gives it a really interesting look. And right from the very start of Battle in Outer Space, you get that really good model work and that really good production design. Again, this starts out with some weird happenings. A railway bridge is lifted off the tracks and a train crashes and then the railway bridge is put back. There are some really weird things. There's a flood in Venice with some frozen icebergs that suddenly appear as the water is frozen. A cruise ship gets yeeted onto a hill in the Panama Canal and things are going wrong. Spaceships start attacking Earth and the flying saucers start attacking Earth. And Earth has to get together a space force, in a sense, to take on these aliens, to go to the moon where their base is, and destroy their base on the moon in order to stop them from invading the Earth. Pretty simple premise at its heart. The aliens have the capability to take over the brains of human beings at a distance and do brain surgery to make them puppets for themselves. And they do that with one of the scientists and with one of the crew of one of the spaceships as well. And so the Earth bonding together again with that internationality and the UN emphasis, bond together to create two battleships in space. Basically, they're rockets armed to the teeth with crews of people who are, who are going to go to the moon on, in the rocket ships, land and destroy the alien base using some new ray gun technology that Earth has developed in the nick of time. Now, again, this production design is fantastic. They use some real buildings, so you get a little bit of outside stuff as well with some interesting brutalist architecture of the 1960s. You also get some imaginatively created sets on the Earth. And the alien base, when you see it on the moon, is kind of groovy. And the people traveling from their rocket ship to the alien basin, kind of doing a Guns of Navarone on it, is really well done. They used some footage where they've obviously gone to some lava field somewhere and then hung a map painting over it so that it looks like they're walking across the moon towards an alien base. All of that stuff is done very, very well. There are a few moments where there are map lines around people when they're looking at things in fact both movies have very few but a few moments when the mat lines are very very obvious but nonetheless this one does play a little bit like the guns of navarone in space where a team have to go somewhere blow up a base and save whatever they're saving um i like the look of this one the space suits are kind of groovy the aliens look like Oompa Loompas in space suits. I think they're played by children. But the aliens are really the point. The adventure and the destruction is the point of these kind of movies. And together they make a really nice pairing of space opera movies, which are, in the special effects sense at least, way above what America was producing at the time. Yes, America had done Earth vs. the Flying Saucers, and they did War of the Worlds, and, and those things are iconic and are important, but 
and less than a decade later when they were making the Mysterians and battling out of space, the Japanese did the special effects better. And they gave us, they were kind of bolder as well. Having a battle with an alien base in a dome with a whole bunch of human-created energy weapons which basically have to land like a, a lunar module because they've got a range of only one mile, so they've got to be launched like a rocket, land, and then zap this alien base. That stuff is groovy. It's beautifully done. It's well thought out. It's well executed. And it has that post-war Showa era Japan look that I love. I mean, love with the aesthetic of that era in Japanese history. And the streets uh, are interesting in the cars they've got and the way people are dressed with people, some people in traditional dress, some people in modern European style clothing. It was in that transition in the post-war period where a lot of Japanese culture was changing and the Japanese economic miracle was happening. And it's a, a kind of exciting time to see on film and to enjoy the product of, in this case, these two movies. Now, there was a third movie that thematically could go into this, a movie called Gorath, which Ishiro Honda did as well. I haven't watched Gorath yet, but when I do, I will review it for the channel because I'm in love with this particular time of Japanese tokusatsu movies. And I like the fact that the, some of them didn't have just giant monsters in them. They had, they had a much more emphasis on the actively invasive alien threat. And that's a theme that uh, Japan was really engaged with at the time because they'd seen the invasion from both sides of the coin in their recent past history. And they then turned it into entertainment, which can be cathartic as well. May have triggered some people because of various things in the, in the previous 20 years of Japanese history. But nonetheless, they were incredibly popular and they were incredibly successful financially. And Toho made a lot of money from these two films. In fact, The Mysterious was the first movie that Toho did in anamorphic widescreen using a process they called Tohoscope. And that really made these movies accessible to an international audience because America was looking for things they could distribute cheaply, which were done in widescreen and a, a kind of technicolor process. And Tohoscope was perfect for that. And these movies did make money for Toho Studios and the American distributors in the American market during the 50s and 60s. So I just wanted to talk about these two movies because I love them. I love the way that they did their space battles and the way the strategy works and the way the special effects blend into that and the way that most of the stuff that the human beings do is either meetings about what's going on and what they can do about it or reactions to the way the battles are going even though there are those astronauts that go to the moon and destroy a moon base for the most part it's people looking at screens going well um it, it's great stuff it, it's of its time but i don't think it dates in in a real sense as far as being purely entertaining escapist adventure cinema and i love them for that there's not a moment of cringe in either of these two films which is a bit of a relief so that's it for this time around. Thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like, subscribe, leave a comment, hit the notification bell. You can also support the channel financially by donating at patreon.com slash cherrytalksmovies. Got some stuff on the weekend that I'm going to do that I'm going to enjoy. Until next time, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Watch some Japanese tokusatsu movies. And then you can say tokusatsu in a very knowing way. And I'll catch you next time.